And uh, we are here today to talk about climate response, mitigation, and adaptation. And what I should say just a word about what that means. Mitigation, as you probably all know, means preventing climate change. Adaptation means learning to live with the climate change that you have been unable to prevent. Um, and it used to be that people in the environmental community sort of uh, didn't want to talk about that because they were afraid it would take the pressure off uh, the work that obviously has to be done to stop CO2 emissions or to find a way to take CO2 back out of the atmosphere. But now uh, the basic situation is we've gotten uh, – events have overtaken us, and there's really – I think there's pretty a broad consensus now that the – uh, we are going to have to adapt because some change is already happening right now. Um, we have a panel who is uh, really qualified to tell us about that. Uh, on my far right is Amy Frankel. She is the uh, North Regional Director uh, for North America for the United Nations Environment Program. Uh, she is a lawyer by training and has been uh, – was for six years a senior counsel for the Senate uh, Commerce Committee or for the Ocean Subcommittee of the Senate Commerce Committee and has extensive experience both in the private and governmental uh, sector uh, nationally and internationally. And she's going to be able to tell us a bit about the global situation. Uh, next to her is uh, Munjed Al-Sharif. He is a uh, – has a Ph.D. in civil engineering. He's from Jordan, I should say. He has a Ph.D. in civil engineering and uh, – with a specialty in water resources. He's now the coordinator for the UN team in Jordan that is working on adaptation strategies. Uh, and he's a, also a senior advisor to the government on water issues, has been a director of an environmental institute there, long experience with the water problem. Uh, to my left is Major General Muni Rizaman of Bangladesh, uh, a retired Major General. Uh, he has uh, founded and is the president of the Bangladesh, Bangladesh Institute of Peace and Security Studies and is a specialist in security issues, uh, edits an academic journal on the subject, uh, and, and has also done work on climate change and water security in the Himalayan Basin. Uh, among his past experience, he, was a, he was a UN, led a UN peacekeeping force in Cambodia. Uh, and next to him is Brian Fagan, who is a, uh, an anthropologist by training and a professor emeritus at the University of California at Santa Barbara. He has a long and distinguished career as a writer on the past and on archaeology. He's written an unbelievable number of books, uh, including a four-volume series that I recommend to you on, uh, on the history of climate. The last one of those was called The Great Warming, I think, uh, and it was about the medieval warm period, which was the last period in Earth history when it got... Uh, rather warm. Um, and he is going to tell us a little bit about how past civilizations have, have fared in this sort of uh, stress. But let's start with uh, Amy. Uh, Amy, you probably are best uh, able to give us just sort of a, an overview of the global uh, landscape. And tell, tell us what issues uh, with regard to climate and adaptation to climate change UNEP is most concerned about, and, and what are you doing to, to help? Uh, sure. Good, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's good to be here. Thanks. And this is a very important issue. I'm glad that the, uh, uh, it was included on the agenda because, as Rob said, adaptation has kind of taken a back seat. Uh, and one example, I want to tie my remarks to what's happening in the U.S. The U.S., as you uh, probably know, uh, there was several bills in Congress that were trying to make their way through uh, to deal with climate change and energy issues. And adaptation had been in some of those bills, uh, but it was taken out along with uh, most of the international clean energy or tech uh, provisions. And the reason for that was that it was viewed as a political liability, that Americans don't care about you know, overseas. Uh, they don't want to send U.S. taxpayer dollars overseas to help other people. It was not going to help people get reelected. So I want to talk a little bit about why should the U.S. care about what happens globally uh, in terms of adaptation? And then how do we go about uh, addressing it? So first, why should the U.S. care? There's lots of different arguments uh, to answer that question. One I would call sort of more soft arguments. Uh, there's a humanitarian argument and an ethics argument, which is that the U.S. and other developed countries uh, to date have the largest uh, share of the carbon and other greenhouse gas emissions. And to the extent that that is going to lead to changes around the world, uh, there's a, an obligation to assist other countries uh, 
as a result of that. Now, that argument hasn't gotten a lot of traction. Uh, you can speculate as to why. Uh, another would be, uh, you know, again, the humanitarian issues. We're going to have a lot of people around the world in very dire situations, people who already are living below the poverty line. You know, the U.S. should step up its aid and assist. You know, that's what I'd call sort of a soft argument that I don't think is getting much traction. But there are some harder arguments, if you will, some economic arguments and some self-interest arguments that we can also bring uh, to bear on this issue. First uh, is a security issue. And in fact, there was a report several years ago uh, by, it's called CNA, um, which had 11 retired flag officers, so generals and admirals of the military, who all concluded, this was in 2008, I believe, uh, that climate change will be a threat multiplier. And they cited such issues as uh, global instability, that is, developing countries face the, the impacts of climate change. Uh, there's going to be strains on resources, natural resources, water issues. You know, you've heard about some of that this morning. Uh, and they will, will not be able to provide for their people. So there will be political instability, there will be conflict, and there could be increased threats such as terrorism. Another is immigration. There are predictions that because of climate change and its impacts, especially in low-lying areas, but again, around the world in terms of uh, people wanting to go somewhere where there's a better life uh, because of what's happening in their country, there will be an immigration threat. Or, or issue to deal with, and not just you know at the U.S. border, but uh, in many places. And then actually, the military looked at even what what are the risks to their own assets. The Navy has you know military assets that are low lying uh, around uh, on, on coastlines. Uh, so they looked at it really from a self interest point of view. Uh, the administration, this was in the Bush years. Uh, had cast some doubts on that, and there's been s uh, several studies after that, all which pretty much say the same thing. So, you know, the military needs to plan. It doesn't deal with politics, and it has said, you know, this is something we need to watch for. Um, the last thing I'd say is, in terms of the global nature of our economy, and we are a globalized world, and the U.S. has, like many countries, investments and relies on supply chains you know, for its goods and services. So, for example, take Starbucks. Uh, we were talking this morning uh, uh, with some folks about this. You know, their coffee comes from outside the U.S. Uh, so much of what we have in our resources comes from outside the U.S. So it's going to be very difficult to have stable investments overseas and stable supply chains um, in the years to come. And so the U.S. really does need to, to also care about this globally. So how do we do it? There's a couple of elements to what we need to be doing. One first issue is data. And this morning there was a, a discussion about climate science. And the fact is it's not perfect data. There is uncertainty. And we have to acknowledge that. I think we can't hide that fact. But the National Academy of Sciences of the United States just came out this May with a report that said uncertainty about exact impacts is not a reason to wait to act. And there were lots of sort of metaphors for why we should go ahead. One I like best is if nine out of ten doctors tells you that your child is sick and you need to bring her to the hospital and one says don't worry about it, a responsible parent will take their child to the hospital. I mean, we know it's coming. We don't have exact data, uh, but we do have to start to plan. And the National Academy suggests that we plan for a range of possible outcomes. The fact is, too, that the science is getting better every day, so we, but we can't wait until it's perfect. Uh, we have to act in the face of uncertainty. That said, I mean, there's a real issue of trying to get the data out of the ivory tower, not just globally, but also in the U.S. The National Academy did a, another report on how the U.S. takes the data we have on climate change and gives it to people to make it user-friendly, if you will. So if you're a farmer, you're trying to plan your crops and how you deal with the season and the changes. How do you get the best data to those people? So we're facing that globally as well, and we're working with entities like the World Meteorological Organization and others to try to uh, create some networks for that. A second is uh, you need a strategy, and the National Academy also said that um, in terms of the U.S. policy. Uh, the UN is also working on that with other partners to help developing countries create national strategies for adaptation. So that's a, a very big effort that UNEP is working on with, with others. Um, one aspect of that that we are really 
advocating is that that we look at what we call ecological investments as in infrastructure, investments in our ecological in infrastructure, as opposed to, let's say, just building a seawall and saying we're going to fix this through a techno technological approach, looking at nature and how does nature already protect us against climate change. So, for example, we did a major report on what we called blue carbon, and what it found is that Coastal resources like mangroves and seagrasses actually absorb more carbon than land-based uh, terrestrial uh, resources like forests. And yet oceans have not really been in the discussions in, in the uh, UN uh, climate negotiations. So we're trying to bring that to people's attention and make the case that protecting mangroves and investing in that natural infrastructure makes a lot of sense. It also provides tremendous services. And one example... Uh, we did is if you invest sort of the return on your investment in coral reefs and in mangroves over a 40-year period, for coral reefs we, we found it was about a 7% return and in mangroves 40% return in terms of the economic benefits you get, like uh, creating healthy fisheries, uh, protecting against climate change and storm surge, etc. A final point on the, the how do you do it, there's going to be a real need for coordination, and I actually had a discussion with USAID about this, and they're very aware of it, because there's going to be so many people rushing, uh, NGOs and governments and, you know, UN entities all going into these countries saying, you know, turn left, turn right, do it this way, build it that way, and there's going to be a real need, I think, for regional coordination, and again, the UN is trying to pull together centers so that there can be a coordinated effort and that we're not working at, at odds with each other. The last thing I'm going to say is, um, just to give you a hint of some something else that we're working on, is, uh, you know, the issue, the line between mitigation and adaptation, I think, often gets blurred. And one example is, in fact, the investment in, in uh, natural uh, ecosystems. Um, we are also looking at what I'd say is adapting our economies. And you've heard about the green economy. And essentially, you know, working with governments to help them to shift where they're investing and how they go about growing their economies so that it's sustainable. So we're looking at major sectors around the world, you know, in, in ag, in transportation, in the obviously in the uh, energy area, uh, to try to make these leapfrogging shifts to new technologies so that uh, we both to sustain those entities, those economies, but also to obviously to deal with mitigation and, and get away from, from the current emissions. So let me stop there, um, and I'll be happy to answer questions um, as we go forward. Well, one, one thing that occurs to me, would you, where are the, where are the, the climate hotspots that, and is there, are, should the U.S. be taking concrete action? I mean, should we be giving my, people money to build seawalls, or uh, aside from helping with the process and help giving them our data, uh, is there, is there any, would, would that be desirable, and is there any chance of that? Uh, yeah, I mean, I don't want to speak directly to what mm -hmm. the U.S. should or shouldn't do. Or the U.N. or some. But, but yes, I mean, we, just as the National Academy said that the U.S. should act and have a strategy, mm -hmm. uh, we absolutely uh, uh, believe and we're working with countries to help them create a strategy, a mm -hmm. uh, national strategy, and start to plan how do they deal with the impacts of climate change that will occur. Mm -hmm. Does the World Bank have a climate adaptation strategy? Absolutely. World and are Bank. they investing heavily in this? Uh... Yeah, there's many players. World Bank is one of them. Also, something called the Global Environment Facility, or the mm -hmm. GEF, mm -hmm. uh, has an adaptation fund. Uh, adaptation did finally make it onto the uh, discussion, into the discussion at the UNFCCC. Uh, so it's in the negotiating room now, and uh, there is a recognition that it needs to be addressed. Mm -hmm. Well, we actually have someone from, from probably the, one of the biggest climate hotspots right here next to Mir Munir. Uh, Bangladesh is, 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 aside from the Maldives, is probably the country that is most immediately threatened by climate change. Uh, what, uh, give us a sense of the, of the signs that you're already seeing there and uh, uh, what, how, how you see the, the future. I mean, you're, you're different from the Maldives. You have 160 million people, so... 170, excuse me, <laughs> out of date. <laughs> um, so what's going on there right now? Thank you, Jeff. Uh, as Jeff uh, mentioned very rightly, Bangladesh is probably ground zero in terms of impacts of climate change. So 
What I want to bring the perspective to you is not concept, not theory, not the debate between the alarmist and the skeptics, but something that is really happening on the ground to people and to people's lives and human lives. In terms of the impacts of climate change, a lot of impacts that we hear outside is practically happening in Bangladesh at the moment. I shall just briefly list to you the major impacts that we are experiencing now. In terms of the natural disaster patterns and flooding patterns, it has dramatically changed over the last couple of years. We are now getting increased flooding. We are now having more cyclonic storms with increased ferocity and more loss of life and property. A statistics that was taken over the last nine years has shown that in a nine-year period, Bangladesh has experienced 95 weather events of severity that affects people's lives in large manner. In terms of the flooding that we have, the intensity of the flood, the duration of the, of the water that remains stagnant has increased many times, affecting people's lives. It has also affected the loss of biodiversity in the country in large parts of the country. And as you know, Bangladesh houses the world's largest mangrove forest, the Shundabans, which is a uh, UNESCO uh, habitat site, heritage site, and that is very clearly dying in front of people's eyes. And primarily because of rise of sea level around that area and saline intrusion, salinity intrusion into the inland waters and inland lands, which is also affecting the agricultural patterns and crop patterns in the country, loss of livelihood of farmers, and also the marine fisheries that you normally get, the river fisheries that we normally get in Bangladesh and on which a large number of people live in that livelihood pattern because it is a river and delta with rivers. A U.S. journalist who recently visited Bangladesh very rightly wrote that uh, the face and the taste of climate change in Bangladesh has a saline taste. So you can feel it. You can feel it affecting people's lives. And the saline intrusion into the, into the river system is affecting the complete marine life of the river systems in the country. We also having increased sedimentation in our riverbeds, which is raising the riverbeds also increasing the flooding potential in the monsoon season. And that is causing another major problem in the country. In the coastal zones, we are seeing a gradual loss of land due to soil erosions. So we are seeing increased land loss in the coastal areas and in the river basin areas. There is a major water resources problem in the country at the moment because the water cycles have changed. A river and delta like Bangladesh essentially lives on water cycles. That is the ecosystem on which the life-sustaining systems are built in river and delta, unlike any other country or a territory that we normally see outside. And due to the change of the water cycles, uh, the, many of the river, river and systems in the country are dying. We are seeing loss and the death of rivers in the country which has a direct impact on people's lives and on the economic viability of the state as a whole. Bangladesh has 54 transboundary rivers that comes along the Ganges River Basin Delta or the Himalayan Basin Delta. Unfortunately, in a change circumstances of stress of water, most of the countries in the upper riparian areas are becoming insular or inward looking and are beginning to withdraw waters both in China and extremely extensively in India, affecting the flow of rivers and the flow of water into Bangladesh. Thereby, as the rivers die and as people's lives are affected, their economic livelihood is being challenged, we are beginning to see the inward flow of IDPs or internally displaced persons in more and more people who are losing their home states, the agricultural land, their ability to sustain themselves economically, are uh, finding ways to come to more unplanned urban areas, putting pressures on those urban areas and making life difficult not only for themselves but for others in those areas. And we are predicting that this will give rise to more social tension 
and tension over scarce resources eventually entailing probably social conflict over scarce resources. As Amy briefly mentioned, it has been also predicted in the IPCC's predictions that a one meter rise in the sea level will be causing a 20% loss of Bangladesh territory to the sea. And when that happens, it will be a scenario of producing 35 to 40 million climate refugees. And that is a frightening scenario because uh, the world has never experienced such staggering numbers of people who are displaced and become refugees, and they not only go for internal migration within the country, but they have to go for cross-border migrations. And cross-border migrations of such staggering numbers will eventually, in our predictions and study, in, involve into tensions on the border and eventual conflict along the border, not only on an interstate basis, but ha having impacts on regional stability. With such amount of challenges and pressures coming on to the country, which is essentially, in my category, a soft country because it has very weak institutions and it can be characterized as a fragile country because it does not have the national capacity to deal with some of the multiple challenges that it, would, it is facing today. And when such challenges increase and are multiple pressures brought on to the country at one moment, at one time and point in history, we could eventually also see the potential collapse of a political order. And that, in my mind, is a frightening scenario, because here we are not talking about thousands of peoples in Darfur or a few hundred thousand peoples in the Maldives. Here we are talking about 170 million people. And any signs of instability of that nature has severe consequences on security domain, not only for the country, not only for the region, but it has severe security implications on the international order. And we as members of the international community have to understand that this is a, this is a scenario that is probably being played out and we are seeing very definite early symptoms of that happening on the ground at the moment. Therefore, we need to take stock of that. Having said that, I shall very briefly mention about some of the measures on adaptation that we are currently adopting in Bangladesh on a national basis. Uh, the, the country and the government has promoted a diversified rice production capacity, trying to adapt to the changes of salinity that is coming in the water and the soil, and trying to adapt to a new varieties of rice that can be grown in those, those conditions. We're also trying of new varieties of fish that can, be, that can survive in those saline conditions in sweetwater rivers. We are in the process of building increased number of flood shelters and cyclone shelters all around the country, and over 2,000 have already been built so that people can take refuge and survive during cyclones and severe weather conditions. We are also providing, trying to provide drinking water to people because they don't have access to drinking water in the coastal areas, in flood-prone areas, and areas which are already affected by impacts of climate change. There are also efforts in providing and engineering more infrastructure for drainage, in particularly in urban areas, so that we have reduction of flooding in the monsoon season. We are now trying to also to cope with the options of finding out more health consciousness in the rural population so that they can survive under the tremendous challenges of health conditions that they are facing right at the moment. There are efforts being taken to raise the the level of the ground on which they build house, houses to a level that they can initially survive the flooding that occurs on a regular basis and is, is, is increasing. We are also trying to mainstream climate adaptation policies into all our national policies, not only in our development policies, but in all our national policies, climate adaptation policies are, are being brought in and being mainstreamed. And a very 
important step that has been taken now is that we have included climate adaptation strategies and the impacts of climate change into all our school and all our study curriculums. So young people from the first grade have to learn about ways to cope with climate change and adapt themselves if they want to survive. I shall stop here and come back to other points as you go on to the discussion. Thanks, Munir. Um, has, has climate change already affected Bangladesh's ability to feed itself? What has happened with agricultural production? We have had a food security situation in 2008. Uh, that was the most severe situation we had. But after that, we have somehow managed to survive by importing cereals from outside the country. But as we lose more agricultural land to salinity, to soil erosion, and to the sea, food security will become a major issue in the country. Another issue that I forgot to mention, the health security situation in the country is becoming a major issue. Due to unplanned use of groundwater, because of other conditions or induced conditions of climate change, Bangladesh has gone through a very severe condition of arsenic poisoning. A recent study by a British scientific journal has come out with a very, very negative staggering figure that 77 million Bangladeshis are already infected with arsenic poison, which essentially means that almost half the population of the country are already poisoned by arsenic poison from groundwater that they have used for drinking for other purposes. And is if this is this natural arsenic, or is this a pollution uh, problem? No, this is a natural arsenic that contaminate, got contaminated because of uh, unscientific use of groundwater. Mm -hmm. And if that is the case, uh, the paper has also mentioned that this is the world's largest mass poisoning of people. And this is a major uh, health issue for the country. And as people become more and more marginalized due to loss of livelihood, these cases are going to aggravate. We've also seen in our study in my institute that uh, one of the most vulnerable groups in the country due to impacts of climate change will be the issue of gender, because 70% of the people who are most vulnerable are women in the country, and they're the, the people who have the least capacity to support themselves or find help elsewhere. There was a, an international conference in London, was it last year, I think, where uh, that was specifically designed to try to elicit support for, for Bangladesh, was there not? Do you, can you tell us anything about that? What, was, what kind of reaction did, as I understand it, Bangladesh was seeking the aid of Western countries to face these, these problems? What, what, what was the outcome of that? There was a conference in London where donors came together to pledge about 100 million pounds, pounds sterling, as a donor fund which has been created under the World Bank. The money has not been released as yet. Uh, most of the adaptation measures that the Bangladesh government in its NAPA has identified cannot be supported by the national government's fund alone because Bangladesh is not a rich country, so it cannot fund all the adaptation measures that it feels it needs to do immediately. We have lost some very critical time. We are past the point where we have the luxury of debating and discussing the science of climate change because it is something that is happening on the ground right as, at this very moment and we need to adopt the adaptation measures on an urgent emergent basis. Uh, but the funds that the government has on its own is very, very inadequate, so it is seeking international help, but the international ha help has not been f coming forth, forthwith because there is a tremendous debate going on about providing adaptation fund to countries which need it because, as Amy mentioned, that there are a lot of skeptics who feel that this can open the floodgate and it can open the doors of obligations of, in the West, and the West is very, very skeptical about that. Similarly, there is no recognition of the fact that there could be climate refugees. We have recognition of all categories of refugees that happens out of conflict or of out, of, out of other situations. But the UNHCR has not yet recognized the status of climate refugees because then it brings up the whole issue of obligations of other countries to accept and give them the status of refugees. Let's, let's, let's turn now to a, a very different situation, not too much water in Jordan. Uh, Munjed, tell us a little bit about the, the 
the uh, crisis you face there. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I'm really glad to be here among uh, such distinguished uh, audience. Uh, and uh, as uh, Rob mentioned, uh, we uh, in Jordan have uh, a bit of a different situation regarding uh, the uh, uh, impacts of climate change. Uh, I should uh, probably be starting by uh, uh, talking about mitigation uh, a little bit in Jordan. Uh, uh, we look at mitigation in Jordan as uh, probably uh, or di differently than, than uh, 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 some other nations that are well developed. Uh, as you know, uh, uh, Jordan is a developing country and uh, uh, it is moving uh, in the direction of uh, having uh, or acquiring more uh, economical uh, uh, projects and uh, development initiatives. And uh, we initially thought of uh, mitigation as probably something that will hinder development, uh, which means, uh, as you know, mitigation uh, requires you to uh, 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 have a cap on your uh, uh, emissions, uh, on green gas uh, emissions. And uh, uh, at least we believe that this is not really very equitable uh, in terms of uh, you're asking me to reduce the emissions while uh, uh, I'm not really well developed or reaching the development stage that I look for. Uh, uh, this does not mean that uh, uh, Jordan will not be working on the mitigation uh, area or field, but it uh, uh, means that we, uh, Jordan requires better technologies, a cleaner uh, production technologies, so that it will develop or goes, goes in, in the direction of development, but yet uh, maintaining a very low uh, emission uh, rates uh, to uh, protect the environment. Uh, uh, now we started in Jordan to feel, uh, the, uh, as they say, the impact of climate change. And uh, we look at the impacts of climate change uh, uh, very seriously in Jordan uh, for the specific reason that we are uh, a, a, the fourth uh, poorest country in the world in terms of water resources. I probably uh, need to mention an estimate to you by saying that uh, uh, we only consume, or the per capita share, the daily per capita share of uh, uh, water in, in Jordan is about 25 gallons. If you wanna uh, compare that to a reasonable number that you might uh, really uh, be familiar with, which is the 110 gallons per day for an American or Canadian citizen. Uh, so we are basically using less than one fourth of the amount of water that uh, being used in some other countries. Uh, now, I, I have also to mention that in, in our region, there is, uh, in addition to the uh, scarce water conditions, we have political instability. Uh, and uh, as you all know, uh, we uh, have uh, uh, shared water resources between Jordan, uh, Syria, Israel, Lebanon, and the Palestinian Authority now. And, uh, the level of uh, uh, increase in the population is uh, high compared to other nations, which means that the, the, the people who need water are growing in numbers in a drastic manner. And also the water resources are being depleted because of the climate change impact. So uh, this is kind of a very tough situation to be in, where your people number is increasing and yet your water resources are being decreased. This is why uh, water is becoming a major issue in Jordan. And now, uh, because of, uh, probably I have to mention a few s s simple statistics that might bring the atten your attention to the uh, importance of the problem in Jordan. We uh, have just released in Jordan what's called the second national communication, and uh, this is basically a report on the uh, vulnerabilities, vulnerabilities uh, and uh, adaptation and mitigation issues related to climate change in Jordan. and. Uh, most of the studies uh, uh, released in that report says that our precipitation will be reduced between 10 to 15 percent, uh, depending on the location, and our surface runoff will be reduced from 15 to 20 percent. And again, this is why we, we look at this uh, issue very seriously. Now, the final outcome of, uh, of all these impacts together, together with, uh, with our need for economical development and the increase in numbers of uh, the population and the political instability, we're finally uh, uh, at the stage where our water quality and quantity are being degraded. So it's not really an issue of water quality or uh, quantity only, but again, the water uh, quality is being uh, very much degraded. We are. Uh, 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 overdrafting from our groundwater resources twice as much the safe field, as they say, which means that the natural recharge that will happen every year 
we are basically pumping twice as much from groundwater, which means in a very short period of time, very few years, we'll be having less, water, less groundwater resources, which means also a very uh, a, a, a kind of critical situation in terms of the quality of the groundwater resources. Now, uh, uh, the major adaptation programs, or before I go into ad major adaptation programs in Jordan, I would say that um, there is a major risk to uh, uh, food security. We have major food security issues now in Jordan. And I hope you can distinguish between food security and food uh, sufficiency. Because um, uh, if you go, for example, to other countries who are uh, poor in water, but they are rich in energy, they can provide or they can really uh, be able to sustain their population because they have the financial resources to do that. Uh, which means that uh, they don't have a, a, a food security issue because they can always have the alternatives. I, I wouldn't say the same in, in Jordan because uh, uh, we might end up with a food security issue because we don't have enough resources to kind of cater for the food needs of our uh, population. Uh, so uh, food security is becoming an issue and uh, probably has been mentioned many times uh, 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 from my colleagues here in, in the panel. Uh, the most vulnerable are the poor uh, in Jordan, and I would add or to that uh, the farmers. So we have the farmers sectors or the farming sectors, and the, uh, the poor are, including women and children, of course, are the most uh, uh, vulnerable to uh, the impacts of climate change. And these are the target groups that we uh, are working on uh, right now in Jordan. Uh, finally, in a very uh, short uh, uh, time, uh, I would say that our focus for adaptation will be uh, in the uh, reuse of treated wastewater uh, for many uh, uh, purposes that were not used before in the past. Uh, we used the wastewater, uh, treated wastewater in Jordan in the past for uh, planting ornamentals, uh, for um, uh, uh, landscaping and so on. Now we are thinking of other areas that, uh, including, by the way, uh, food uh, production. Uh, we are also uh, focusing on uh, uh, what's called uh, in Jordan the water safety plans. Uh, uh, drinking water safety plans. We have plans for providing the drinking water to the population, but because of the decrease of the resources, these plans will be very much at risk. And we are developing these plans so that we will be able to uh, uh, provide the needed uh, amount of uh, drinking water for the population. And again, please remember, we are not talking about a huge amount. We are trying to maintain the 25 gallons per, uh, uh, per capita per day. And uh, of course, uh, just on the side, because there are many other things at the policy level that has to be done, we are working very um, uh, actively in mainstreaming adaptation strategies and program into the uh, government and non-governmental organizations. So it's become like a day-to-day -day issue and part of their daily uh, activities. Uh, if more uh, uh, discussion will, will happen, we, I'll give you, I'll brief you more on many of the activities that we do over there. Thank you. Uh, where, where, what is the main source of water for Jordan? Is it groundwater or is it Jor the Jordan River or? Uh, but well, in the past, it used to be uh, uh, the major, the major resource of water is the Yarmouk River. The Yarmouk River is, by the way, uh, uh, originating from the uh, heights in Syria and Lebanon and the Golan Heights. And it is being shared by, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, four different countries. Now, that water resource is being depleted at a very uh, uh, high rate, uh, which means that we have to look for other options. This is why I mentioned that we are now moving into pumping more groundwater. So we have, yes, we have groundwater, but uh, unfortunately we are pumping, pumping the groundwater at an alarming rate. So uh, I would say surface water is there as a water resource. Yermuk River is there. Mm -hmm. The Jordan River is not uh, being... Uh, uh, I know many of you will uh, know about the Jordan River more probably than Yarmouk River because of its historical uh, uh, significance. But now uh, I would say the Jordan River is uh, only uh, 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 having a flow of uh, uh, less than 10 percent of what we call the historical flow, mm -hmm. uh, which means the historical flow before the development of different uh, uh, kind of water harvesting uh, projects uh, uh, around the river. Yeah. So. Uh, uh, I would say it's it's disappearing as a river. I'm, I, I hope some of you will will be will have the chance to go and visit the uh, Jordan River. Right now, Jordan River is uh, really uh, 
a very small stream that you can, you can walk across and move from the Jordan side to the Israeli side in, in a very uh, uh, easy manner. And what about this project we've heard about to uh, build a canal from the Red to the Dead Sea? How much is, that, is there? Yes, uh, I mean, a sign or not? Well, well uh, I mean, uh, we we in Jordan look at this project to be a, a kind of our lifeline, uh, and I'm, I'm very serious about that uh, because um, uh, I, I will also talk about another historical uh, site in Jordan, which is the Dead Sea. I'm sure many of you have uh, heard of the Dead Sea. The Dead Sea is basically uh, being, uh, uh, the, or the level of that uh, uh, sea is uh, reduced by about one meter a year. This is not really a sea like the Mediterranean Sea or the Red Sea or whatever. No, it's actually a, a, a closed lake that is being fed by the Jordan River. I talked about uh, the reduction in the flow of the Jordan River, which means less water is coming into the Dead Sea. The development project around the Dead Sea for uh, capturing as much water as possible into the different countries, and basically these are uh, Syria, Jordan, and Israel, are also reducing the amount. So the, the, the Dead Sea is disappearing. Uh, 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 now we are thinking or uh, we are at the planning stage uh, together with Israel and the Palestinian Authority. And this is a regional project. This is not a Jordanian project. I have to mention this. Although we look at this project as a major uh, uh, lifeline to Jordan, but uh, it is a regional project where we would uh, pump uh, about 1 billion cubic meter of water from the Red Sea all the way to the Dead Sea. Uh, uh, we will use the uh, elevation difference. Uh, as you all know, uh, the Red Sea is at zero meter level, sea level. The Dead Sea is at four, minus 400 uh, uh, level, below the sea level of uh, 400. We will try to use the elevation, elevation difference in uh, uh, generating electricity that will be used to uh, uh, desalinate about 700 uh, uh, a million cubic meters of water that will be uh, distributed among the three nations. Uh, we in Jordan will get the uh, most uh, of that portion, which is, which is about 570 million cubic meter, to be pumped to uh, the Amman area, the capital of Jordan, and other major urban uh, cities in, uh, in Jordan. All right. Well, we, Brian, do you think in about five minutes you can give us in a sense of uh, how ancient civil, what, what lessons we might learn from ancient civilizations and and uh, how how they fared with past climate change? Maybe, you want me to strum minutes. the historical? Yes, guitar. exactly. <laughs> it is very difficult, and one of the most striking things about this meeting for me is the lack of attention and history paid to the lessons learnt by our forebears because my distinguished colleagues have scared the hell out of me with brilliantly articulate accounts of what's happening today. But there was nothing new in human behavior, and it's very important that we understand what people did in the past for lessons for the present and the future. For example, cities are about five to five and a half thousand years old. In Iraq, the city of Uruk had about five to 10,000 people in about 4,000 BC. But then in 2800 BC, there was a major drought, and the people of Ur, who survived on irrigation at the village level, one of the lessons of history is that many of the most successful water management projects are done at the local level, even if you tax them. The leaders of Ur were forced, because of drought and reduced flood levels in the rivers, to ration food and water. They also had to build a large fortification wall called the De Repeller of Amorites, grandiose titles and nothing new, to keep out desert nomads who were trying to graze their starving stock on fixed agricultural land. They survived, but the price was horrible. But they survived because of three things. One, leadership, two, the use of human hands in large numbers to undertake public works, and third, the most basic thing about water, gravity. A German engineer in the 18th century once remarked, excuse my caricature, if you build the dam or the canal, the water flows from the highest point to the lower one. 
That is absolutely true, and everybody in the past knew this. The Mesopotamians, the Assyrians, the Sasanians, who absolutely screwed up Iraq by doing unthinking centralized irrigation, which raised salinity and devastated the countryside, and Iraq is still paying for this. Egypt, where there was flood irrigation for thousands of years, there was in 2800 BC a major drought which lasted several centuries, sorry, 2300 BC, major century, and the kingdom fell apart because centralized leadership didn't work. Who cope with it. The provincial leaders, many of whom were people of impeccable pedigree, one of them learned swimming with the pharaoh's children. But they controlled frontiers, rationed food, ensured that the correct land was cultivated near the river, and they controlled the movement of people, which my distinguished colleague was pointing out is one of the most critical problems for the future. They closed their frontiers. But the point I want to make here is that there were so few people in the world, and many of these adaptation problems were straightforward. Did you know, for example, on a lighter note, that the first people to develop a flushing toilet were the ancient Minoans of Crete in 1800 BC? And the Englishman who found it remarked that their sanitation arrangements were better than those of 19th century England. It's true. But the point about this is another theme in the history and adaptation, which is the aqueduct, the providing of a continual flow of water, which was begun in Europe or in the Mediterranean by the Minoans, was done very early by the Chinese, and the Greeks and the Romans brought it to a fine art. Some of the most fine water managers of the past were the Greeks, because they developed water supplies based on limestone deposits, on cast, which provided a continual stream of water for the city of Athens. But then it, and to bring in another theme, it solved at least partially another problem, which is the problem of urban sanitation. They simply had this continual flow of water, and after its was used, it went in the drains, was flushed out and used for fertilizer on fields. Again, Careful water management, but food was local. Water management, as much as possible, was local. Rome, of course, took this on a far larger scale, and Rome confronted major problems of urban sanitation. But there, on the whole, with permanent water supplies, things worked. But for things the Romans brought in, which is something which is around today, and it's very important in America, is a sense of entitlement. And this came out at the Water Symposium yesterday. The water should cost you next to nothing and be freely available. We blame the Romans for starting this. Another lesson of history. Let's now move. And I'm giving you literally a little ditty of musical instrument because I really didn't have time to prepare for this. I want to take you to the southwestern United States. How many of you have been to Chaco Canyon, New Mexico? Ooh, we have some literate people here. If you have not been, and somehow we must get the money to take these gentlemen there. <laughs> it is the most remarkable place because in this semi-arid canyon in the San Juan Basin in New Mexico, they built nine enormous great houses or pueblos. And these were in an area which can only support 2,200 people with subsistence agriculture. And the way they did it was by using natural spring seeps, by irrigating the seasonal watercourse that ran through the canyon. And then at certain times of the year, many more people came in there for ceremonial activities. 200,000 wooden beams were carried into that canyon from distances of up to 50 miles to build the pueblos. So you're talking about a major, major informal infrastructure based on kinship. Now, this is where it gets interesting in terms of adaptation. The ancestral Pueblo have very, very strong oral traditions of movement. Movement in the face of rainfall. Too much or too little. And in about 1150, there was a horrendous 50-year drought. What did the Anasazi did? 
They didn't wring their hands. They didn't dig ever deeper wells. They moved. And the great houses were abandoned. So one of the most effective adaptation strategies of the past is movement, which is in some ways why people think they can move in the face of water shortage or food. It's a natural human thing. But my only statement here is that we live in a world where cities aren't in the thousands, they're in the millions. And the most bizarre thing is that we deny this. And I had a man at a lecture I gave in Orange County, he was a conservative Republican, saying to me, how dare you say there's a water shortage? All we've got to do is pump. Can I give one more example? Yes. Let me give you a final example from the ancient Maya. How many of you have been to the Maya ruins? You are a literate group. <laughs> the great pyramids. And you look at them and you say, whoopee, pyramids. Wow. But I want you to think of those another way. Because some brilliant research has established that, in fact, one of the primary functions of these pyramids was what they call water mountains. It would rain, and the Maya built an extraordinary civilization of great cities and scattered villages in a lowland tropical environment with not very fertile soils, with highly unpredictable rainfall, but numerous swamps. They built this civilization ruled by competing very warlike lords who were very arrogant. But they lived at the pinnacle of a society. They had temples atop these temples, uh, pyramids, which they turned into water mountains, if I may quote a colleague. When it rained, the rain would cascade down these pyramids into channels, into cisterns, because one of the great water conservation and storage ways of antiquity is the cistern, the reservoir. And then, during the dry season, they would parcel out the rain to a carefully irrigated local landscapes nearby. But there was the social obligation to the man or the woman at the center, the lord, the great lord, who was a shaman, who appeared in trance at great public ceremonies atop the pyramid where he would gash himself with a stingray spine and spill his blood. And it's no coincidence that part of this social contract, the major part, was water rituals. Because they were known as the lords of the water lily. Their headdresses were water lilies. Why? Because water lilies grew in their reservoirs. And then, in about the 10th century AD, there were a series of droughts, each of which occurred, very profound droughts, at about 50-year intervals, documented from deep sea cores, documented from lakes. What happened? No rain the first year. Fine, there's enough water. By the fourth year, people were saying, hi, lords, how are you? Where's my water? I'm entitled to the water. The sense of entitlement was kicking in. And to cut a long story short, because I've talked far too long, Maya civilization in the whole lowlands fell apart. What did the people do? They moved, they dispersed into their villages, but probably thousands of them died. So please, don't tell me that the past isn't relevant to today and tomorrow, because as he pointed out, we're in the business of looking things that affect people's lives. And the past is a story of adaptation when things affected people's lives. So it sounds like what you're saying is the big adaptation to climate change is going to be the mass migration, and maybe what we need to do is find a way to do that under reasonable conditions, to accept it, to not be viewing it as the threat. There's going to be an exodus of 30 million people from Bangladesh. We need to, maybe we need to be... It's, it's very humbling. Rational, being, uh, it's very humbling, actually, about being an archaeologist, mm -hmm. because you can take refuge in the past. And I can say, I've spent two and a half years writing A History of Humans and Water, which is coming out next year. But I stop, more or less, at the Industrial Revolution, because all the rules change. But it's been terribly humbling, because I've always thought, oh, the past, it's fun, which it is. But I've realized how relevant it is. And... Some of the really fascinating things you were both saying 
come home to roost in my world because one of the most powerful things about Egypt was that movement. And then you've got Cambodia, where there were monsoon failures and El Ninos. People had to disperse. So archaeology in the past has a startling relevance to the study of climate change, and I would point out that National Geographic has given very little coverage to ancient climate change. No, I'm not. I'm serious, because it's part of the context. Can I just say one thing? Okay, then we should really open it for questions. No, uh, listen to his presentation. What really strikes me is that, uh, unfortunately, nature does not recognize the current geographical political boundaries that we have built for ourselves and we have caged ourselves in the kind of political domains that we have created the comfort zones in. Mm -hmm. Like the transboundary rivers don't know the political boundaries between nations, they just flow. So the moment you interrupt them, they kick back in, in manners that affect human lives. Correct. Actually, can I add something? Okay. Um, Very quickly. Just in terms of migration, I, I, I think we do have to look at the past to look to the future for our solutions, but as you also pointed out, the world has changed. And the fact is, we heard yesterday that population is estimated to grow to not only 9 billion, but possibly 11 billion at the high end estimate by 2050. Uh, I have some statistics on cities. We've got uh, in over, cities with over a million people went from 11 cities in 1900 to 378 in the year 2000. It's estimated that we'll reach 599 by 2025, with 80% of them in developing countries. And so the question is, where will you go? And even in today's world, managing refugee and displaced people is an enormously difficult task. And so certainly, uh, while we have to plan for it and anticipate it, having that as an adaptation strategy, I think, is not uh, a viable way forward. And we need to look at some of the planning uh, that the UN and other partners are doing uh, at the national and regional local levels. What, can I say something? Actually, what? we really need to open it up in case people have, does anyone have some questions? Uh, we only have about 10 minutes left. <coughs> sorry, sorry. Let's, right there. Um, I was just hoping that uh, you could maybe describe to me the nature of the international laws that govern Who would be Amy? Is that something you can tackle? Or? Yes. I mean, it tends to be there's not a global, you know, treaty on international. I mean, it's going to be regional and, and uh, binational. And there certainly have been uh, plenty of negotiations between countries that share uh, river resources. I think uh, we actually heard about some in Jordan, you know, where the, the three countries that share the river are, are working on a solution. So it's really uh, regionally focused, not global. Can I add yeah, to that? Um, I mean, um, I have uh, been working with, um, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm working with the UN system helping the Jordanian government, and we were working with the Jordanian government in terms of their transboundary waters. And uh, the two examples that we have uh, discussed uh, basically were uh, uh, the uh, underground water aquifer shared between Jordan and Saudi Arabia called DC and uh, the uh, surface water shared between, uh, the Yarmouk River shared between, as I mentioned, uh, Syria and uh, Jordan. Uh, there are, uh, there is no uh, international law regarding how much water you can take from each river. Uh, there are certain guidelines, but no specific uh, uh, international law. And uh, uh, we went into, into that when we were trying to have our share with the Yarmouk River in, in, negotiation, in negotiating with Syria. I would mention this specific example. Syria, for example, in, in a previous agreement in 1976 between Jordan and Syria, uh, we were talking with the Syrians about building 26 uh, dams or allowing the Syrians to build 26 dams in the upstream uh, of the uh, Yarmouk River. And uh, uh, unfortunately, now the number of dams is 46, uh, 46 dams. So it went from 26 all the way to 46. Uh, which means that uh, in the original uh, agreement with them, uh, they were allowed to take 156 million cubic meter a year from the uh, uh, from the Yarmouk River, and now they are taking to, 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 taking more than 260 million cubic meters. And we cannot really go into international law and agreements on that because there is nothing that says they are not allowed to take that much water or uh, whatever. It is an agreement between the uh, uh, countries who are 
are sharing a certain water resource that has come uh, basically to be uh, acknowledged by all. Okay. Other questions? Hi, from the Aspen Global Change Institute. And uh, last year we brought together um, in the United States water managers and climate scientists, so as user communities and I guess producer communities of information about how to adapt to climate change. And I'm wondering about, and so that's now been called climate services and we started a climate service office. I'm wondering how is that playing out on the international scale, um, particularly in developing countries, getting the scientific information in a way that's usable for policymakers, um, even farmers or, or, or people below the policymaking communities, and anyone that has any comments to say. Sounds like you, Amy. Yeah, yeah um, the World Meteorological Organization actually just held its third uh, meeting on this, and UNEP and others uh, uh, participated in that to address just that issue. And it's what I—it's certainly the example of NOAA is a great one. I think it's a great model uh, to look at globally. And the issue again is how do you get the data out of the ivory tower and into the hands of people, both in terms of the, what the information is, and then how do you deliver it? And so there's all kinds of creative approaches being looked at, including you know, cell phone technology and, and other sort of networks. Uh, UNEP is involved in creating a series of, of regional networks for climate change data and adaptation uh, where you know, the information can be provided to national and, and not just governments but other users. So that is something that we are actively engaged in. Okay. Uh, so I'm from Nepal. I'm Surya Dungyal. One of the things, you know, just we, we, we have uh, ignored is we, even the, we talk too much in uh, even the UN system. You know, I was part of it in you know, work in Cambodia and uh, Liberia. Uh, there are vast amount of traditional knowledge and skills that the local people have. And the kind of pressure upon them. And we talk about much about uh, recognition of their local traditional skills. But uh, the amount, the kind of support needed for them, compared to the the kind of policy utterances that we make, the support is very low. Actually, there has to be. You, you mentioned about it, the regional cooperation and the, the UN, you know, and the UN system being involved in that. Actually, unless this policy is changed, right? We because uh, when we talk about the traditional knowledge and skills. And we really fail to really support to the scale that uh, require uh, you know, them and that so that you know, they can really manage their own uh, you know, resource management uh, uh, patterns that they traditionally you know, are uh, enriched, you know, and they, they, they have, you know. So I think there is a gap, you know, this kind of the support gap. Although we have, you know, knowledge gap, the whole climate change issue, they don't know, they, they never think uh, it about from a uh, climate change perspective because there is a no knowledge gap. And there, there are institutional gaps also, and there are kind of also resource gap. But in, in bridging these gaps, the support, I, I, I think, is very less. You know, what do you think? You know, how, do you, how do you, from the UN perspective, you know, respond to that? Is that for Munjad or for... Yeah, for uh, well, um, uh, I guess uh, I, to I totally agree with you. And uh, initially, when we started about uh, our uh, joint program adaptation, um, uh, uh, especially since the focus was basically water, uh, as I mentioned before, our focus for adaptation program was water, whether at the quality or uh, or quantity level. We discovered that there is a major gap between the the, the authorities, uh, you know, the, the managers of, of water resources and uh, distributors, and so on. Uh, with the, uh, I mean, the, the, the gap or the uh, kind of uh, disattachment between the, the two levels, I mean, the, the, the government and the uh, local communities. And uh, surveying the uh, available knowledge with the, with the local communities, I totally agree that they have, in many cases, 
they have uh, 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 more uh, uh, expertise in managing their uh, uh, water resources in a better way, except that the laws had come later, and the uh, set of legislations that were put by the government have taken them away from uh, being able to manage some of their water resources. And uh, I would say that uh, we are believing right now in our joint program with the UN uh, joint program that in order to ensure success of uh, uh, of uh, the, uh, diff the different components of the program that the local communities, uh, farmers, uh, women, uh, local groups, uh, civil societies, and so on, should be very much involved in the uh, managing of uh, these programs. So, yes, definitely, I totally agree. And I think we should be working more into uh, that direction, uh, not only from this joint program in Jordan, but also from all other initiatives uh, dealing with the water resources management. You want to come in? Yeah. yeah. Uh, in our experience also in Bangladesh, we strongly feel that most of the solutions are local. Most of the adaptation strategies at the ground level have to be found within the traditional knowledge and expertise that is available. But uh, we all know that there is a huge amount of donor politics here. Whenever the money comes, it comes with plans and strategies, and it comes with big plans and big equipments, which sometimes are not sustainable. So we have to balance between the two. Hmm. That's interesting. Yes, sir. Uh, my name is Shay Fyander from the Environmental Defense Fund. I just wanted to thank all of you for your uh, really interesting presentation. Um, I thought it was interesting that you were touching on the topic of um, these transnational migrations of people, especially given that um, just a few states away or whatever, there's this huge debate about Mexican immigration to Arizona, which is caused by economic stress as opposed to all these other issues. So I'm a little bit um, concerned when I hear this talk about how you're going to suddenly have millions of people that are moving, given that um, it seems as though a lot of people in the West are uncomfortable with even small numbers of people moving for economic opportunity. So I was wondering if you envision some sort of tangible aid that will be given to countries that are water stressed in the form of maybe like shipments of tankers full of water, the construction or the repurposing of pipelines that we currently have, and infrastructure we currently have for shipping oil around the world to be shipping water around the world. Because it seems like some of the countries that are the richest are some of the countries that will probably be still um, well supplied with water, like a country like Canada or a country like New Zealand or whatever, where some of the countries that are poorest or most water stressed with the most of the highest numbers of potential immigrants are the ones where water stress is probably going to be most severe. Who would you direct that at? Would, um, any, any I would direct that at just yeah. any idea. Well, I actually I saw a news report just recently that I, I'm not totally sure of the accuracy of it, that there was a deal between a company in Alaska and the city of Mumbai uh, to ship Alaskan water to Mumbai. But I, I, as I say, I'm not positive <laughs> that's true. It sounds insane to me, but um, so maybe it's already can happening. I, can I comment yes, on you? that? Uh, I mean, uh, this basically strikes, uh, as, as they say, home. Uh, and uh, I, I was talking uh, early, uh, earlier about the... Uh, 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 the, the Red Dead Canal and uh, the major, uh, although we are at the planning stage, as I mentioned, very soon we'll be uh, releasing the uh, environmental impact assessment uh, report and the feasibility uh, study report. Uh, but the major issue is basically funding. So uh, uh, the, the, pro the uh, project will, will cost uh, at least, uh, this is the most uh, uh, kind of, uh, or the modest estimate, about six billion US dollars. And uh, there is no way in the, like for an economy like Jordan's and that of the Palestinians and the Israelis will be able to support a project like this. So uh, here, here comes the, the issue of, uh, uh, for example, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the wealthy countries to support some of these projects because I, I tell you, and uh, both my, my son and daughter were born in the USA. Bo both of them are US citizens because I was studying at the USA when, 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 when they came. And uh, uh, my son is uh, uh, 18 years old now. And he keeps telling me all the time because, you know, he, he, he knows I'm working with the water issues. This is what I do all my life. And he says, well, Dad, uh, and, and this is kind of uh, uh, very strange, that he's thinking to coming uh, to the USA uh, uh, because of water. 
and, and I would say that this is uh, an issue that even though it looks like very individual, you know, and, and this is my son talking to me, but eventually when, when this problem becomes very general and many people will start to feel this, they will try to find uh, uh, locations uh, and, uh, and countries to go to just because of water. And, you know, because of water and what comes with water, because I would say that maybe in the very near future, uh, because the countries are sharing very limited resources, they will fight over water. If these Syrians feel that they are not getting as much water as they want to their citizens, they might try to uh, uh, create a war with, with their neighbors and so on. So, uh, so yes, uh, th this is very important. It not only help the, the people to, to stay in their land, but also maybe to diffuse uh, certain political uh, instabilities that might uh, appear in the future. So uh, um, I think the, 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 gen the presence of the general here and the, you know, with his military background and security issues is really a, a, an issue that we should consider when talking about water issues and water security issues. The question is that uh, some studies on the psychology of human migration indicates that nobody wants to be uprooted. Unlike the economic migrants, the general nature people, they don't want to be uprooted from their natural habitats. But when they're compelled to move because of lack of habitat, they will find dry grounds and high grounds to go, however you want to stop them. But we have to understand the reality, particularly in the West, that this is something that we have got to face someday, maybe one decade or two decades after. So we've got to understand some of the realities that are coming to face us so that we are not given the kind of the strategic shock that we should try to be averting. I think we're going to have to stop there. We're already a few minutes over. Thank you very much to all the panelists, and thank you all for... It's part of our green economy work. Oh, I had heard it before. I'm working right now with our overlay. I'm getting this level to meet the issues.